Joseph was facing a huge disappointment about his idea of marriage, but there was more. He was facing family disappointment. Now, the scripture that is just before what we read, I didn't want to bore you with, with my, or bother you with my pronunciation of a bunch of, of Hebrew names, but it lists, uh, I think it's 28 generations of family tree of Joseph that come up to this point, which to us seems like not really like a great hook intro. But in the, in the ancient world, this was extremely important for three, at least three reasons that I can tell you. One was Matthew's telling us there were plenty of myths about the gods who died and rose again. Those were called the mystery religions. And he's saying, I'm not telling you a story that you're supposed to just draw information from. I'm telling you about a person who lived for real and his life sent ripples out that are still affecting people 2,000 years later. And so I'm going to start by telling you how he's connected, what his genealogy is. And you think Ancestry.com is big now. It was much bigger to the Jewish people in the first century. And so it was really important to know where they came from. Secondly, Matthew's making clear that Judah is in exile. And that's also important. And I'll just give you a snapshot on that. They didn't have their own king. And so everything was dislocated. Have you ever felt like something happens in your life and nothing fits together right anymore? There's a hole in the center and nothing is like it's supposed to be. And I'm not just talking about when it rains for seven days. I'm talking about those really big life pieces that leave us totally dislocated. That is what exile was for the Jewish people. Nothing was as it should be. And even though they were living in their own land right now, they were living under the, denomina the domination of Rome. And the idea is that they knew that nothing was the way it was supposed to be. So in some ways, they were living a national disappointment. And third, Matthew wants us to know that Joseph is a direct descendant of the kings of Judah. So he's telling us he's a descendant. You, you may have heard of King David. And it traces his, line, his lineage through David and then through the other kings so that Joseph is a direct descendant of David. This would have a lot of ramifications. Now, it did not mean that he had any power. Rome was in power. There was no king. But because genealogy was so important to the Jewish people, you better bet this meant something. Have you, any of you grow up in a family where there was a fair amount of family expectation, like you need to um, reflect well on the family, that sort of thing? Like you, you, um, you are expected to uphold the family legacy. Maybe it's a military legacy. Maybe it's a leadership legacy. Whatever it is, you have felt that family pressure. Well, Joseph's would have been exponential. And it wouldn't have just been his aunts and uncles and parents, but like the community would have known that these were descendants of David, and so they would be looked to to set an example, to provide leadership. Mary also was descended from, like, there's a lot of generations here, so it's not like they're kissing cousins, but she was descended from the Davidic line as well. And so this was like a good match that people, aunt, aunties and uncles would have approved of. Everybody's planning for the wedding. This is how things are supposed to be to reflect well on our family. The burden is on you to carry on the family legacy. And then huge interruption. And Joseph doesn't have the backstory like we do. All he knows is someone that he has put trust in has betrayed him. One of the worst pains in life is putting trust in someone and having them betray us. And I don't think anybody needs explanation about why it's painful to have somebody run around behind your back, right? That seems pretty obvious. And on top of that, I think the usual feeling is I'm so stupid. Do you think that Joseph spent some time like, did I miss the signs? I did not see this one coming. I can only imagine that this was really, really painful for him. And I wonder how we found out. We got to see kind of a, a depiction of it today, but I'm picturing like, you know, his aunts and mom saying, something's going on with Mary. Have you checked out her figure? That kind of thing. So it would be family conversation. Um, and I'm so struck by his restraint. So he had several options. It wasn't common at that point 
to like execute people for this sort of thing. But it was common to have a public trial where he could basically say, it wasn't me. You know, the kid is not my son, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and then it would be, the focus would be on, she's bad, I'm exonerated, and we move on. But Joseph wasn't comfortable with that. He didn't want to humiliate and embarrass Mary. He was looking for the best option where he could protect his family legacy. He was supposed to hold up this pure lineage for the future, but he didn't want to humiliate Mary. So he was going to divorce her quietly and move on. But he paused. It said while he considered this. He wanted to keep the law but he also wanted to show mercy to someone that he cared about. And he was caught in that tension, and he decided to wait and to pause. Bible calls him righteous, which means he treated people well. And I'm wondering if a working definition for righteousness that we see in this passage is that we would respond, not react. And sometimes I think the most righteous thing we can do is to pause. To pause and wait not do the first angry thing that comes into our head. Can you imagine how this story would have gone if Joseph had immediately exploded in anger? Jesus would still have been born, but Joseph wouldn't have had a place in the story. He would have missed his assignment. He would have missed his part. He was able to hear from God because he paused. He was literally sleeping on it, we read this passage together, a few of us that get together to read the Bible in the morning, and Monty said, I identify with Joseph because I fall asleep when I'm trying to think about problems, and now I know that that's how God can speak to me. So if you fall asleep when you're thinking about problems, maybe that's a good thing, because you're giving time for God to speak. What perspective could God speak to you if we followed Joseph's example of righteous relationship? Because righteousness sometimes means just taking a pause to let God do what we can't do. Then Joseph was not afraid to take a risk. God told Joseph that Mary's pregnant by the Holy Spirit and invited Joseph to have the biggest risk, the biggest adventure of his life. So first of all, he's invited to take this incredible risk, take Mary home as your wife. Rather than distancing himself from Mary's scandal, which would be the natural thing to do. He takes, he embraces it, opens the door to his home and says, we're going to walk through this together. In many ways, he covered her scandal with his own. He probably would have been disgraced in the eyes of the community. And he did it because he listened to God, because God asked him to do this part in his story. Secondly, Joseph um, Joseph took this risk with his reputation. He got the opportunity to protect her. He allowed other people to draw their own conclusions rather than managing what people think about him. He made that decision that's really important that we all have to make as we grow up, that what you think about me is none of my business, but that I am responsible for what God tells me to do. And so rather than managing his image, rather than, than making it his goal to not disappoint the family, he walked forward in something that would continue his family's legacy, but that not everyone would understand. And finally, Joseph was released. He made a choice to obey God despite other people's opinions. He made a choice to obey God even though people are going to be disappointed with him. I'm 45. I wanted to say 40. Did you hear that pause? I almost light up here. I was like in my 40s. Um, anyways, 45, really. And I am learning this year that it is a real option to disappoint people. That you don't have to spend your whole life managing other people's disappointment that that's a waste of energy. And like Joseph, rather than managing other people's opinions, I need to focus on what is it that God asked me to do? What's that next step that he's asking me to take and let God do the things that only God can do? You and I, 
will not get the opportunity to parent the Messiah. But we get some other opportunities. In this story, Joseph has to let go of being the hero. Because he, at this point, the destiny of his family rests on him. Maybe he would be the one who would be restored as king, like, because he's a descendant of David. So if that happened, if Rome was thrown off, he would be the likely one to be king. And there were probably dreams in his heart. I could do it. I could be the king. I could set everything right. And this is the moment when he dies to all of that. That is not going to happen. In fact, He's dealing with disappointing every single person around him. But in that moment, he is making room for something that only God can do that's so much greater than his own dreams. And so we may not get the opportunity to parent the Messiah. Well, we won't get the opportunity to parent the Messiah. But I'll tell you what, we get to make room for others. Some of you, it's your biological children, and they can be hard to make room for. You ha- we're, we're dealing with kids coming back from college, which is our joy, but we have to let them be, we have to let our daughter be more grown up than we're used to. She, come, she comes back having lived on her own and we have to make room. Some of you have kids coming home for Christmas and you have to make room. Some of you don't have kids or your kids are very much grown and doing great, but you're mentoring people and you make room. I love this quote from Andy Stanley. It says, your greatest contribution may not be anything you do, but someone you raise. Let me say that again. Your greatest contribution might not be anything you do, but rather someone that you raise. And I think that's true for every season of life. You may not be in the little kid season. I want to encourage those of you that are. But those of you who aren't, May you still be fruitful as you are pouring into the lives of others. And may you recognize that it's not about great aspirations for yourself as much as it's about investing in others and making room for them. You don't need to be the hero. I don't need to be the hero. We need to make room for others. We make room for the work that only God can do. Crisis is an invitation. I want to give you a picture that I hope sticks in your mind the way it sticks in mine. In one of the darkest times in my life, a mentor of mine was listening to me cry and say, oh, all the things that were just not the way I expected, dislocated, wrong. And he said, I want you to picture an invitation, the old fashioned wedding invitation that's embossed, the heavy ivory paper, all of that. And it has your name written in calligraphy on the outside. And I wanna tell each of you this, that God, is is not the one that sends death and disease and sadness and grief. But you know what God does send? Is an invitation to grow through anything that you may face. And that's because he's with us. And so when you are facing something that feels so dislocating, I want you to picture that God might be sending you an invitation personalized to you saying, will you walk with me? Will you be willing to step out of what was comfortable? And will you be willing to grow through this? That's what Joseph got was an invitation to open his home rather than pull away and grow through a crisis. He got an assignment to end the exile. His family hoped that someone would become king and end this dislocation, this exile. And he got to actually do it. He got to be the one that ended the exile. But you know what? It wasn't the way he thought at all. And that's the way it generally is with God. It's not the way we plan it out. It's the way he plans it. Because salvation is the work that only God can do. This word here that says, name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is what I want to tell you today. There are things that no program, no king, no... um, better job in the schools, or even psychology can fix. And I'm talking about the darkest part of the human condition. I'm talking about despair and disease and death, things that can't be undone or else we would do it. That is why Jesus came. That is why Jesus came. It's the work that only God can do. And because of that, Joseph just has to get out of the way in some ways. He gets to make room. 
He didn't even get to make the usual contribution of a father raising a child. <laughs> he didn't. Because salvation is something that only God can do. We don't help. We make room for the miracle that only God can do. The things I do, they don't last when I try to help people. I'm learning more and more that me trying to change people is not helpful. But me making room for what the Spirit does inside of people, that's lasting change. It's God with us. Joseph said yes to God's invitation. He opened his home in a way that stretched his faith, and God moved in. Crisis has a way of moving us out of our normal routine. Grief causes us to consider praying. Failure allows us to experience grace. People don't meet God at their pinnacle moments because they don't have time. They don't have space. People meet God when things are dark and low and difficult because that's when it becomes real. That that's why God came to our planet so we would know there wasn't a mess that was too deep for him to reach into. The whole point of this Christmas thing is God with us. That there's not, you don't have to get cleaned up first. You don't have to figure it out because you won't. There are things that only God can reach into, things that only God can fix. And today is a day to let him love you. We discover Emmanuel, God with us, when our plans fail. And in the disappointment, confusion, and darkness, we meet the God who is unafraid of the dark. Jesus is not afraid of the dark. That's why it's a night divine. Could it be that God wants to meet you in your disappointment today? Perhaps you're weighed down with the expectations of those around you or even your own expectations. The baby who was born to save the world, he grew up to say this. You can close your eyes if you want, because this is personal. Are you tired? I say yes. Worn out, burned out on religion, come to me and get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. And so I ask you, are you ready to, to lay down the weight of expectations in order to learn to live freely and lightly? Many of us have grown up with definitions of success that aren't helpful to us right now that tell us all the time that we don't measure up. I want to tell you that is not what God made you for. His definition of success is walking with him freely and lightly. His definition of success is following him. And I also want to tell you that nobody says you have to have everything figured out to follow Jesus. Nobody quizzed the disciples on their doctrine. If they understood it, they, they knew every piece when they started following. And there's a whole group of people in this room who started following Jesus, and they weren't experts. They didn't have it all figured out. They didn't know the answers to all the questions, but they knew that Jesus was drawing them. That's what it means to follow him. That's what it means to learn to live freely and lightly. So I just, I'd like to pray as we come to the end here. I think God is at work when we don't think he's at work. It was this year that I went to Foursquare Convention and this girl like flagged me down and I didn't know who she was. I was pretending I knew who she was. It took me a while. And she told me, in the midst of all that stuff that felt like failure, I guess I went to her school and I prayed for her and I don't remember it. And she said, I wanted to grow up to be like you. And now I'm working with inner city kids and, and inputting into their life and bringing Jesus to them. And I was 
blown away. And believe me, it, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit that did something. Sometimes the places that we think we're going to be successful don't work out. But God does the most incredible work when we're least expecting it, the work that's his alone, the people that we get to make room for. So I'd like to pray.